So we're going to talk about a few things tonight, um, and then we'll open it up to you. We'll bring the lights up and take questions. Uh, the two sort of semi, but it's all very relaxed, the two semi-formal rounds we got, we've got one in which the three guests will um, pick out some of their favorite, uh, one or two of their favorite crime novels and perhaps um, uh, in some cases may read from them and then there will be a little reading from one of their own books. What I wanted to start with was um, the first thing we see when we go into the exhibition, which was a new, very striking quote, but a new one to me, Phyllis, from Raymond Chandler. A crime novel is a tragedy with a happy ending. Um, do, do, do you think that's true? Is there any truth in that? Oh, I think it's very true. Um, and it's interesting, isn't it, that we, we read crime generally for relaxation, for fun, um, just to take us out of our the problems of our usual world. Um, and it's very reassuring. And yet it does have murder, ghastly murder, at the very heart of it. So there is really a, a curiosity there. But on the whole, I think it's an intensely reassuring medium. And that's why I think it's very popular with people who have a great deal of responsibility in their lives. You often find that what they like to read is a detective story. And that's largely, I think, because however difficult life is in a detective story, there is a solution. There is always a solution. You may not get complete justice. You don't get um, divine justice. You get really the fa fallible justice of men. But you do, this, the crime is solved. If it were not solved, it wouldn't be a detective story. And I think that's what people like. So it is a happy ending to that extent. To that extent, although in the best um, crime novels, and indeed in yours, we should, have, we should have a strong sense that someone has died, that there has, and, no, that, and that, 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 that can never go away. No, I agree, absolutely. But that, I think, is comparatively modern. If we go back to Agatha Christie, sometimes I wonder if she knows how the, how the corpse became a corpse. <laughs> there is really no horror there. There's no disgust. There's no pity, really. But that is happening now mm. because I think detective, well, we'll be talking about that, no doubt. The, 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 the detective story is increasingly becoming the good novel. Henry, um, a tragedy with a happy ending. As Phyllis was suggesting there, it's a historical, which is why they've got it at the yeah. start of the exhibition. It's a huge change now. You do now have uh, crime novels in which the crime is not solved or they get the wrong person. Yeah. I mean, I got turned on to the genre, I think, because I discovered books that actually didn't have happy endings, that didn't resolve anything any 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 great crime that, that didn't have a sense of redemption actually in a way um, issues of um, what's now known as noir fiction if we go back which actually was around back in the 1920s and 30s and, and a bit later and particularly with novelists like Jim Thompson um, who wrote the novel of course killer inside me now that is a classic noir novel that actually for those who have read it and for those who, who are perhaps more unfortunate have seen the film um, <laughs> it ends in an absolutely brutal, nihilistic fashion. And, and, and classic noir fiction does that. The, the re there are no happy endings. The term is, is often misappropriated, actually. I, I, I noticed at the exhibition here, they're talking about Nordic noir. Now, most what we know as the, the Scandinavian crime novelists actually aren't what I'd call noir novelists. But nevertheless... The, the genesis of the, the sort of crime that I like, the psychological, more the, the more psychological uh, crime novels, um, certainly don't have happy endings generally. Uh, they can do, but, they, but most definitely not necessarily. And it's more to do with actually exploring aspects of, 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 of warped psychologies, uh, for want of a better word, if not um, really psychopaths, because that in a way is too much of a contrivance. But nevertheless, it's that slippage from being a sort of a figure who is on the edge, perhaps, of, of, of what they're doing and then spiralling out of control. And I think crime handles those, those or the, the genre in, oddly enough, an entertaining way, um, very, very pertinently and perceptively. Jason, if um, whether the bull kills you or the bull kills you, um, somebody's going to die in the book. So it's, um, to what extent can they be have happy endings? Well, I suppose... I just think um, that comment of Chandler, I mean, I think um, it's the solution thing. I, I'm assuming that that's what was at the forefront of his mind when he came up with that, because it's, you know, there's this idea that, yes, there's a problem and then it can be solved. Um, so, yeah, so you, have, so you have to create the problem and then to solve it. But I think 
there's something, there's an echo, I think, of the religious experience in this. Um, if you, you know, look at the New Testament story of the New Testament, it's the sort of the ultimate tragedy with the happy ending and the resurrection of Christ at the end. Of whatever. So I think um, it's interesting that for the first, whatever, say 50 years of crime writing, it's, you have got that solution. Because in a way, it's coming in, I think, I think there's an interesting parallel between um, the l sort of the way that society is losing, or the way that the church and religious authority is losing its control over, over society just as the crime novel is, is coming to the fore. So the 1860s, it's immediately after publication of The Origin of Species and what have you. So I think at the beginning, in those first few years, um, the crime novel in some ways is playing a role as a substitute for the religious solutions, the religious certainties of the past. But if you can then move away from that, like you, you were saying, with, you know, with the noir novels, and so it's, it's a later development, perhaps, that you, you don't have to have a solution in the crime novel because maybe the crime novel is moving away from being a substitute for, as I say, certain religious certainties in society. Well, I think that's, that's very interesting because it's been said that it is a kind of a substitute for confession. And that accounts for the fact that it's really most popular and it began in Protestant countries. And that's still largely true. Um, well, I think it's interesting if you, because I live in Spain and obviously so it's the country yes. I'm, I'm, I'm observing. Um, and, you know, we spoke a little bit about this when we did the radio programme. Um, the, the crime novel in Spain really comes to the fore sort of in the 1970s. So just as the Franco regime and with it the church mm. is losing its authority. So there's an interesting parallel there between so Britain in the 1860s and you know, Spain in the 1970s. Um, so it does, does you know, it'd be interesting to look at other countries. I don't know other countries and their, and the history of their, of their crime genre enough. But, you know, is there a parallel there with, you know, other countries that religion sort of losing its grip and people are turning to the crime s resolver, let's say, the, you know, the detective as a sort of substitute for the priest. It's interesting that, you know, Chesterton comes exa up with exactly oh, yeah. a priest, you know, Father Brown as his sort of, as his detective. Um, but anyway, so to come back to your point, I mean, I think it's maybe at the beginning, yes, it's, it's harking back to this sort of original tragedy with a happy ending. Maybe we can, we, we draw, you draw away from that the further you are from r the religious The religious grip. thing, I think, um, is very interesting. When I was making that radio series, Val McDermott said something which really, I mean, shocked me and um, actually in some ways appalled me. She said that it is a, it's a Protestant form. She said, she actually said, um, Catholics cannot write good crime fiction, <laughs> which um, I thought was a bit, I mean, partly because I, I, I am a... Is that totally a phrase? Or she's yeah. pretty good. But she, she's absolutely right. It begins, it. I mean, it's strongest, even now in Scandinavia, a Protestant yeah. country, far more than, I mean, you do, it is in Italy, but not to anything like the same extent, for example, or nor is it in South America, the Catholic countries no, don't. No. But it, it, this may be wearing away, but it is an interesting point, I think. And um, when we're talking about it, the other thing that struck me in that Chandra quote is that in literary terms, because um, is certain of Shakespeare's plays, if you freeze frame them or, e or indeed stop them at the interval, they appear to be tragedies. I mean, much ado about nothing. If you stop it after the kill Claudio line, it yeah. seems to be a tragedy, and yet it's resolved as a comedy. The it's Winter's Tale, I suppose, is the same. Need, isn't it? Mm. Out of evil comes good, out of misery comes happiness, out of death comes life. Mm. It seems to be. A small version of that, really. But, I mean, I find, um, as I said, originally, you know, it's the crime fiction back dating from, from the late 19th century and obviously the early 20th century and, and this issue of, of it really, certainly in this country, the Golden Age, being surrounded by or really the, the whole momentum of it to do with puzzle solving to do with actually resolving crimes with very much good versus evil um, and the good invariably being the detective of one form or another that um, whole premise as you say I'm sh you know I can see you know con conceivably religious connotations to that and so on um, but I wonder also how much it's to do the popularity to do with actually pure entertainment and escapism. I mean, Chandler used to talk about this issue that, that actually all, all men need, you know, he used the word men, I'm afraid, uh, at the time, because obviously uh, that was the sort of terminology, but all men need to, to escape the deadly rhythm of, of their own mind at some point. And, and actually by engaging in any form of, 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 of reading literature 
um, it allowed you to, to, to have um, an imagination, a fantasy life, and so on. And, and a lot of crime fiction, initially anyway, and certainly now, being a popular genre was to do with not just escapism but actually entertainment. And the thing that interests me is that is the boundaries between um, entertainment and actually what a lot of crime fiction is about and has certainly become about violence um, and all sorts of, of, of really grim um, social and also psychological issues. Yet somehow it's still perceived to be um, an entertainment, a form of entertainment, and all key best-selling novelists particularly view themselves as writers of entertainment rather than really anything else. Uh, Graham Greene even using the, yeah. the actual term entertainment to distinguish. We'll talk about those distinctions, uh, literary distinctions, uh, later. So, so we've got some more general topics later, but so the first of our sort of formal rounds uh, where we've asked um, the panellists to choose some, uh, some favourites. So <laughs> Phyllis, favorite. first for you. Well, I, I must say The Moonstone. I think that's a, a marvellous novel. It's the best kind of Victorian writing. It's in totally engrossing. It's got a long, long, long plane, plane flight. There you are, it takes it into itself. But it did, nearly all my favourites have taught me something. And this teaches me something about viewpoint, because I think it's one of the first decisions to be made when you're writing a detective story. Through whose eyes, through whose ears, through whose brain are we going to see this happening? And I find that... Um, I like to change the viewpoint so that the one chapter will be in the mind of Dalgleish. Another may be in the mind of a suspect. We could get on to the problem, a very great problem, of ever doing it in the mind of the murderer because you're not supposed to know who the murderer is till the end. And Dorothy Elsay has said that was why you could never write great literature, but that's another question. Mm. But, um, and this is done magnificently. It's a very long novel, and he moves from one character to the other, and we are in their minds. So I learnt that. Then there's a Dorothy L. Sayers, which is actually here in, um, on the display, and that's the, uh, the Nine Tailors. Um, and I think this is, it has taught me the importance of setting. It is a, it's a wonderful story, and the most important part of it is not really the crime, although the crime is interesting, and I'm not sure it's altogether... Um, I'm not sure the, the um, reasoning is altogether. I mean, I, I don't think it could be done in quite the way she says. But what is brilliant about it is that we are back in the Fen villages before the First World War. And a totally different way of life from our own, and it's gone forever. And the way in which she describes the church and the village and the villagers, and then the great flood at the end when all the villagers have to go up the hill and take refuge in the church because all the dikes have burst and there's the flood. Very, very good writing indeed, and um, a hugely enjoyable one. Funnily enough, I forget which American was who disliked crime novels, and he was shown this in an effort to convert him. And he said he'd never read a duller life book in all his life, <laughs> all about bell ringing, which didn't. <laughs> and of course, the bell ringing is, is part of the fun of it. And then there I have um, um, the, fran the, the, the franchise affair, Josephine Tay. Um, very elegantly told, fairly simple plot, but it, it, not only engrossing the whole way, but he is very good at the two women, one very elderly and one middle-aged and not particularly attractive, but very intelligent and a great character. And they come alive. And it's so good to have a heroine who's not 21 and beautiful for a change. <laughs> and it is a, a very good story, and I think I, I love that. Then I, what have I got here? Oh, yes, Cyril Hare, Tragedy at Law. Um, Cyril Hare is an example of somebody who's um, very successful in another field. He is a high court judge who writes very good detective stories, but this is much the best. He's really one of those writers who writes one excellent one, and the others are all very interesting, but never quite achieve it. And here we have a judge going on circuit. And what's fascinating about this book is it takes you back into... The, the world in England at the very beginning of the last war, um, when judges used to go round in, with great pomp and ceremony and uh, with a whole household with them. And there was a, in every sort of town they visited, there was a, the judges' lodgings. It all started with a, with a great sort of procession and a service in the, the largest local church. And then the poor people who'd been waiting for the judge, who were in prison, brought up and tried. 
at the Assize, and every town he visits, an attempt is made at his, on, at, on his life, and in the end, he is murdered. It's a very good detective story, but the attraction for me is the writing. It's very elegantly written, beautifully written, and what it tells me about life in those days, and, and, the, how, and about the law, which has always rather fascinated me. So I've got those, and then, then I've got to, um, C.J. Sanson, The Tudor Mysteries. I, I love this. This is the, the one writing now. Um, long books, and I'm afraid we're rather getting too long, maybe. But um, we're back. <laughs> he is a Tudor historian. We're back here. He has a, a sort of um, hunchback lawyer, Shadwick. Um, and it really, the one in which the king, Henry VIII, makes his uh, uh, passage of, you hardly call it a visit, it was a great promenade up to York to receive, you know, the apologies and the, the substance of the, because of their rebellion. Um, the, whole, the whole court, the whole lawyers, everybody moving, that they, that they managed to do it, I don't know. So it's, a, you know, for me who loves history, that's absolutely fascinating. So I think I've almost got them, have I? I've got the Moonstone, I've got, um, um, yes, I think the Tudor Mysteries, and then um, Dorothy L. Sayers, the one in the Fens, the Nine Tailors. Those are my favorite. Thank I also you. like her Gordy Knight, actually. Hey, Gordy Knight, yeah. I do like Gordy Knight. Many people don't like it, but I, but I think it's very clever because what that does, and it's also a bit of a lesson to me, almost for the first time she used Detective Story to say something that was very important to her about the almost sort of sanctity of a job, of, of work, and the, the position of women in, in the, the colleges and in the, uh, academic life at that time. But um, I like it, very, and it is a very good detective story. So Thank that's my choice, really. Thank you very much. I think um, I've got them all here. Yes, I yes. have. I've got them all here. <laughs> Some, yes, someone I will know. Um, it's that C.J. Samson's, it's Sovereign, that one, is it? Is, um, it, is it called it, Sovereign? It's not my area. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's the one called Sovereign, yeah. Um, uh, Jason. Um, I suppose I, I, th I thought about this. I think that the two writers who probably have most influenced me um, are Siminol and Michael Dibdin. Um, Siminol, because I think, um, I think he understands that there's something essentially poetic about crime writing. Um, and Chester, because Chesterton talks about this as well, he says something about how um, the crime novel, I think he says that the crime novel it expresses the poetry of modern life. Um, and, I th and I feel that with, um, with uh, Simenon as well. I mean, he always talks about how his books would start with um, the, the, the atmosphere, what he called the poetic line. Um, that was always his starting point for any, for any novel. And I think um, often when I read his books, I'd, the plots themselves, they, they, I, they, that doesn't stay with me. What stays with me is the sense of the book or the feeling of the book. I mean, you, May Gray can spend a whole novel just kind of trailing somebody, tailing somebody in the rain in Paris. You know, just, and I just think it's amazing that he can do that, that sometimes very little can happen, but it's just that sense of where you are and, and an atmosphere that, that he just manages to express very, very well in his book. So um, that, was, that was a big influence on me. But also, I think then, particularly Michael Dibdin. Um, I uh, I first heard about Michael Dibdin on the, on a radio program years and years ago, um, and I'd I'd lived in Italy for a while beforehand, and I just thought that he, this sounded really interesting. So I just went and bought some of his books and was immediately taken by it. And I just I like the fact that he's kind of combining a sort of police procedural and de detective um, fiction, so that so that sort of whodunit um, style. Um, but also the fact that he's, he's able to use this to talk about a country that he obviously knew very well and wanted to you know, express all kinds of things about Italy and Italian society, Italian, Italian culture. So after I'd sort of lived in Spain for quite a while, it, was, it, it sort of sowed a seed, reading, reading Dibdin's book sowed a seed very much. So that after I'd lived in Spain, I thought, okay, I could do this. And, and Dibdin was sort of the first person I reached out for as a kind of a, just a, to give me some sense of structure and where to start. Um, so, yes, very, very big influence on me. And interestingly, both um, writers who were writing outside their own yes. culture, the Simenon being Belgian, but moving to France and then writing about yes. France. Yes, yes, I hadn't thought about that. Which I is relatively rare, isn't it? Because most crime writers write about their own, um, well, maybe, their own countries. Wow. Yeah. Maybe it's that, it's that outsider thing. I don't mm. know. I mean, obviously with Dibdin, 
I felt that you know if he could do it, I you know mm. I could <laughs> I could do it as well. You know, as an outsider. <laughs> I mean, I, I think he was never particularly. Um, I mean, I think in Italy, I'm not sure if his books were ever very successful. I remember an interview with him once where he said, you know, I think at the time, Italian, um, it within Italian society, crime fiction was still sort of looked down upon. It was the, the, the yellow books, and it was just sort of, you know, like pulp fiction, I think. I don't know if that's changed since. Um, but, uh, yeah, it sort of gave me the courage, in a sense, that this guy, he could, he'd done it, and he'd done it very, very well. And I thought, if I can, you know, aspire to those heights, that would, you know, that was something, as I say, just something to, to reach out for. Um, I was asked to design a, a... I teach creative writing at the uh, University of East Anglia, and um, <coughs> I was asked um, to design a, a master's module on crime fiction, uh, writing for crime fiction. And I, it, I spent about a year deciding what set text I would, would have on that um, list um, for that course. And... I made a decision quite early on that I wanted to really concentrate on, on, on the genesis of the modern crime thriller, um, as I came to call it. And the, the ten novels um, that are on that list, um, I guess, in a way, one way or another, actually are my favourites, or at least are representative um, of particular subgenres, um, or at least began... Um, were the beginnings of those subgenres, um, and I'll just go through the list very quickly. Um, and then, then, uh, then there's one novel in there particularly, I think, that, that that impacted on me or has impacted, influenced me more than most, in particular when it comes to my own writing. Um, and the, and we and the course is, is a ten-week course. But the, the first novel on there is um, Chandler's *The Big Sleep*, which of course is 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 though Dashiell Hammett effectively is credited with really. Um, being the originator, if you like, of, of the hard-boiled style. Um, Chandler, in my mind, took it to uh, another level. Um, the next novel um, is, as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of my, my uh, a, a very sort of disturbing novel, um, the classic noir novel, Jim Thompson's The Killer Inside Me. Um, and in fact, all the, the students I taught this year, none of them had read it before, and they were really quite shocked with, with that novel. It is, it is quite brutal. And, and to think that it came out in, in um, six, over 60 years ago, again, is also really quite, quite shocking, I think, and surprising. Um, <clears throat> the next novel, after we, we, so we did Hard Boiled, then we did Noir, and then we um, did Psychological the psychological thriller, or at least the beginning of it, which I, I, to me, I really take that to be uh, Patricia Highsmith's The Talented Mr. Ripley, um, which I think is an extraordinary novel that manages to, to create a character, Tom, Tom Ripley, who, who really um, is not just a murderer, obviously, um, but actually has an appeal. You can, you can, you can not quite sympathise, but you can empathise with this guy. And, and it's an extraordinary thing that I think that Highsmith did, and it's an extraordinary thing I think she did with actually the genre by creating this character. And to me, getting into the, the head, the mindset of a criminal was really quite revelatory, and I, I found that a, a, a really interesting premise. Um, after that, we had um, um, John le Carré, The Spy Who Came In From The Cold, which, of course, is, I think, the, is the greatest um, spy thriller um, ever written, and uh, and and also one of the one of the great British novels of of the twentieth century. Um, following that, the, the only one novel in translation um, I wanted on 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 the uh, list was Marge Sewell and Pere Willou's Rosanna, the first in the series of the Martin first in the Martin Beck series, which I think is again the, the beginning of the modern police procedural and, and the way that, that those two authors writing together uh, in, in a seamless fashion managed to create um, a sense of, of place, a sense of time and, and, and what it really was like to investigate um, some, some really brutal crimes was, was extraordinary and it said an awful lot about um, um, the, the welfare state of, of Sweden at that particular time. So they managed to do a number of very interesting things. Um, and after all that rather sort of heavy, dark stuff, the, the, the other one of the novels um, that I particularly wanted to get in there was, was Elmore Leonard's Get Shorty, because I think humour 
humor is one thing that, that crime manages, strangely enough, to do very well. Um, but there are very few crime writers, I think, who actually do it very well. But Elmore Leonard, I think, is, is an absolute master at it. And, and that novel particularly is, is, is utterly hilarious. But it's not just that. It's a, it's, it, the characterization is superb. The dialogue, of course, is, is absolutely fantastic. And the plotting, um, too, he, he manages to do all that. It's quite extraordinary. And then following from that, we had Val McDermott's The Mermaid Singing, which, which again was the first novel really to, to look into issues of, of, of the, the psychological, the criminal profiler, um, Tony, Tony Hill there. And um, it, it is a novel that, that, that addresses issues of, of, of not just um, I guess, you know, the, the serial killer, the psychopath, but also actually gender. Um, and she was, she was very much at the forefront, I think, at the time of, of, of trying to get across these more sort of feminist issues, which came in there without actually sort of ramming it down <coughs> your neck. And I think that was a clever novel. And then the one novel we had under the bracket, the, the, literary, the literary crime novel, was Martin Amos's Night Train, which I think is an extraordinary novella actually that 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 it in part um is actually a sort of hard-boiled or a homage to um the, the genre and particularly writers like Chandler and also Elmore Leonard actually um but it moves into a different terrain towards the end of that novel and it actually addresses you know is this you know has a crime even existed here and what is what is what is a crime actually and so I think that's a wonderful novel and then and then the I think that the best global best-selling thriller writer on the planet at the moment is, is one of our own, um, Lee Child, who was formerly, of course, Jim Grant, born in Coventry. And I think he has managed to um, create something in his, his, his character, Jack Reach, in an extraordinary series. Uh, and he can, he can really write that guy, and I think he, he, he does... Does things which, which one did you do? First we, one? we did no, we oh. did the affair actually, oh, right. because it was was the one that the novel that came out last year, and it and it and it um, sorry the year before actually it's out in paperback now, and it's really about the beginning <coughs> or, or how Reacher became oh, yeah. what he is. So so that worked, and then <coughs> the last novel in the series, because it was a particular recent favourite of mine, was Denise Mina's The End of the Wasp Season, which mm. I think she's a she's a great writer who who manages to to bring in aspects, not just of, of, of police procedural, but actually, again, she, she, she's very, very um, keen at exploring the psychological issues of crime and both the perpetrators and the victims, and that's something that's very important to me. And indeed, Catholic Confession is very yes. important in that um, uh, novel, um, although by written by a Protestant, but yeah, it's... Um, so uh, we'll talk about a couple more general things, and then we might take some questions. We might do the readings from your own work um, towards the end, I think. We might um, try that. Um, the question of the investigator, because the other side of that Chandra quote, we had a, a tragedy with a happy ending. His, other, his much more famous comment is, down these mean streets a man must go who is not himself mean. But the, the character of the... Because one of the reasons it seems to be crime fiction is tragic is that... Um, the investigators tend to be fairly tragic figures. I mean, Zen in Michael Dibdin is extremely tragic. Uh, we're, we're now going to have a very polite argument. Um, Dal Gleish, to me, is quite a tragic figure. Well, he's a doctor's wife and mm. baby, and I think that's a, yes. Uh, I'm not sure he's tragic apart from that, actually. Um, I think in the golden age, um, with the women writers, and we're thinking of Agatha Christie, Dorothy L. Sayers, Niall Marsh, Marjorie Anningham, um, I don't think their detectives were particularly tragic, but they were all slightly romantic, and they were all sort of gentlemen, weren't they? They, they were all um, somehow... I'm not sure we felt that they were really real policemen in the way we do today. Um, they were none the worse for that. I mean, we all love them. But um, obviously, with, if you take Dorothy L. Sayers, Lord Peter Wimsey, well, she was quite frank about why she had an aristocratic detective. She was rather poor at the time, and she wanted to write about somebody who had limitless money. And she said that when she got fed up with her miserable little flat, she gave him a wonderful apartment in London. <laughs> when her carpets were showing more than usual wear, she, she made him buy an old bosom carpet. And when she was, her, her car had broken down for the first time, then she gave him a Daimler. 
and occasionally, when she felt generous, she let him drive it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can see that this world was probably much more attractive, or she felt it would be, to her readers than, than having a sort of, you know, Sergeant Plod on the job. And then the others were exactly the same, were they? In fact, when we get to, who is it, Albert Campion, Margie Allingham, that's very mysterious. We're told more or less he's connected with royalty. He's so grand, we're not allowed to know who he is. <laughs> and then we have um, Niall Marsh, and she has Roderick Elaine. And I'm afraid she was rather snobbish. They all seem to me a bit snobbish. I have to accept that. I think with Dorothy L. Sayers, it was an academic snobbery. But with the others, it tended to be social. And with Niall Marsh, it certainly was. She was really, um, she spent her life with some dear friends who were aristocrats. And I think she felt that that was the kind of life she preferred. And Roderick Elaine, you know. And I, uh, the trouble about Roderick Elaine, he has um, either Inspector Fox, I think he must be, as his sort of um, leg man. And he will call him Foxy to show how matey they are. <laughs> <laughs> but I must say, I don't know why I'm rude about it, because these books have given me immense pleasure. And they, they are extremely well written, especially Dorothy L. Sayers. And one returns to them with what we were saying earlier, that sense of being you know, remote from the problems of everyday life, back in a gentler England before the war, um, with a story that never really loses its power, and consorting with these very agreeable people. <laughs> so what is what to worry about? <laughs> Jason, I was very struck in the exhibition by the quote suggesting that um, Agatha Christie disliked Poirot. She refers to him as an ag egotistical creep, oh, and we're, we're told that she wouldn't have him on the... Um, cover of the novels. He, but I think this is more to do with the, uh, the acting interpretations by the late John Moffat, as we have to sadly say now, and um, David Suchet, who's about to do the last one. I, I think there's a tragic quality to Poirot. There clearly isn't there, that he, he's, well, a, he's a loner. Something has happened in the, in the war. Well, he's so pleased with life, isn't he? He's so pleased with himself. It's difficult to think of him as a tragic figure. But I think she did feel, why on earth did I invent him? this silly little Belgium, you know, with his moustaches and his patent shoes <coughs> and his oiled hair. And he speaks very sort of fractured English to begin with, but his English gets better and better as he goes <laughs> on. And in the end, he's hardly got an accent at all. Um, no, I prefer Miss Marple. I think most people prefer Miss Marple. I think Miss Marple is a much more human person. But um, I suppose she's chiefly remembered for Poirot. Mm. But she did really regret that she ever invented him. And I think Dorothy also has learned a bit from that, you know, to do keep him at least fairly normal, otherwise he's going to end up grotesque. <laughs> and Poirot is a bit of grotesque, his little selves. He is, but I, I, I think David Suchet has made him a, a fascinating character oh, in those adaptations, though yes. he does it brilliantly. Um, Jason, maybe um, damage. The, the investigator, we have a sense of damage in, particularly now, don't we, Rebus? I mean, these are people who have seen too much. I mean, that's... Um Wasn't it just, I think it's something to do with being an outsider. Um, it's, I mean, I think there's, a, there's, a, um, there's something to do with the picaresque style, isn't there, I think, in crime writing, and, and there's that influence. And in order, you know, the picaresque hero is always, he's always outside mainstream society. So I think if he is going to be somebody who's capable of seeing stuff that other people don't, he has to be coming from an outside perspective. So if you want to create an outsider, um, one of the things that you can do as a writer is you know, give him a sort of you know, a traumatic backstory because trauma often, or trauma, much overused word, but you know, problems in life, can, um, they're what shape us often or how we deal with them. So <coughs> that's going to give you your particular character, your particular... Um, investigator, the, the perspective that he will have in order to investigate. So I think it's, and also it's just, I mean, maybe it's just easier to write about damaged people. I mean, it's, it's, it's harder as a writer, I think, to write about somebody who's just happy yeah. and getting on with life. Mm. I mean, it's just sort of a writer so trick, but perhaps. But it can get in the way of the plot, can't it? I get, I get awfully bored of the baggage of some of these people. And, and I, I also think that, um, I call it this, this sort of curry, jazz and real ale brigade. I mean, you know, the, <laughs> I mean, all, you know, you know, Rankins, you know, detectives and, and, and you know, no, um, you know, John Harvey's detectives. There was a sort of period of, 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 of British writers creating characters who all drank ale, who all went to you know, the nearest curry house or had a takeout and all listened to jazz. And, and um, I think actually they, the tables are turning a bit and I think that the, the baggage is going. 
actually, and I think for a good thing, because it does tend to actually get in the way of the plot, frankly. And if you're not really interested in jazz or real ale, it's, <laughs> it's, it's actually, you know, you're losing quite a lot of the plot, aren't you? You're losing a lot of the story. And, and I think Chandler... It is interesting, though, isn't it, the way in which the amateur has more or less died. Yeah. And now nearly everybody starting will have a professional detective. And I suppose partly that's because they must have the background technique people want to know about all these wonderful things that the police can do. And I get a lot of help from the, the forensic science laboratory here. And you need it. But um, in the old days, they were really all virtual mm -hmm. amateurs. Not all, but most of them were. I think that's a crucial point, but um, a policeman explained to me once that it's to do with the law now, isn't it? That yeah. if you if you discover a crime and don't report it, you will go to jail. This you're supposed to tell um, you're supposed to tell the police rather than just tootle around and solve it your, uh, <coughs> yourself. But te technology has created another problem, <coughs> but because a lot of policing now, um, either as, as a writer, you know, it's so technical, you know, unless you, you spend an awful lot of time um, researching, you, you, you're just going to not understand it. And then also most, you know, you talk to most detectives, etc., cetera, um, and they, they go on and on about how boring their job is. Um, so I guess hence why the baggage came in. But, but then, you know, you can then shift the story, I think, into actually, which is why, um, Phyllis, you were saying, you know, you know don't bring in the the voice, the thinking of, 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 of the perpetrator, the criminal, but actually it's in a lot of novels now. You get, you know, it's often in italics, you get at the beginning, you get this they little... They talk in italics. They talk they? in it's italics. Like <laughs> it's their warped minds. Mm. And um, <coughs> you, you get, you know, the, the novel with these passages interspersed of, you know, whatever torture they're exacting or, or whatever they're planning to do. And obviously we don't know who it is or even what sex the, the perpetrator is for that matter too, because that's another mm -hmm. twist that quite often comes into the frame. You think, oh, here's a yet another male um, psychopath, but it's actually a female. But technology is um, a good point, I think, isn't it? That um, it's, uh, you see in a number of novels now just the desperation to get the characters to somewhere where they don't have mobile phone reception <laughs> or CCTV um, <laughs> cameras. And of course, DNA, yeah. I mean, honestly. Yeah. <laughs> DNA solves the, uh, <laughs> most of the old ones. You can look at, read, read the books and think, if they had DNA, they, we mm. wouldn't get further than chapter one. It's, it's <laughs> yeah. but, but it's very, it's often very difficult for the writer because I can remember many times, you know, because I've got this time structure, and then I'll sort of say when I'm in the lab, well, how, how long would Dalgreen have to wait before you've got these results from the stomach contents? Oh, well, when we were busy, he might wait 10 days or fortnight. I'd say, I wanted to know next day. <laughs> <laughs> so all his cases are marked high urgency, you know. But still, it is, it is <laughs> quite difficult. And sometimes they won't tell you because it's something they don't want to tell you. I mean, I think they can pinpoint now when anybody telephones, they really can pinpoint mm. almost what room they're in when they're mm. telephoning. But they won't tell you how close it is. So I sort of have to say, well, roughly, you know. Mm. But um, one wants to know all this, absolutely, of course. And not all of it can be told. But I would think in many ways it, it has much less to do, actually. I think, I mean, Chandler came up with the, the, the idea that actually it was the scene, the writing, that was the most important thing. And he was used to, to say that, you know, if people got to the end of his novels and, they, and missed the final scene, well, it really didn't matter because that wasn't actually... Uh, actually, the, the point of them, it was, it was, it was really the writing and the, and the momentum that was built through characterization, description, and so on. And, and I do think that um, there seem to be two camps of writers in a way, in, in certainly in, 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 the, in the last hundred years. Those who actually focus more on, on the writing, and by that I mean, I guess, in, in classic sort of literary terms, characterization, um, dialogue, setting, description, and those who, who concentrate more on plot. Uh, and, and sometimes writers manage to meet those two big and very important components in the middle, and sometimes they don't. And sometimes writers obviously emphasise one, and other writers emphasise the other. There are, there are no necessarily right or wrong ways of doing it, but I think there are two camps. Mm. The thing about technology, there is a problem. I mean, I mean it was when I started writing my novels, I, it, I did start thinking, well, uh, surely with all the technology they've got, you, you know, as you could say, you, 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 could, you could solve anything almost within a, you know, a week or so. But it was when I started doing the research and talking to Spanish policemen, it was a great relief to me to find out that they, 
that there's so many budget cuts that all this technology <laughs> doesn't work, you know. So it's like, I always have this great excuse now, you know, that's why the case goes on for that's so long. Useful, <laughs> I haven't used that, thank you very well, much. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> there's going to be a lot of budget cuts <laughs> in my <laughs> But it, it's also why we see so much cold case fiction now, isn't it? That you can go back into the days when crimes were. Harder to solve, and that's. No, and um, they, uh, they almost apparently in an unsolved murder, they keep all the exhibits, yeah. all the things. That's really remarkable. Keep mm -hmm. for thirty or forty years, and it's never really dead. The case. But also psychologically, that you have these. I mean, it happens in real life that you have these people who think they've got away with it for yeah. forty, fifty yeah. years, yeah. Uh, and have married, had families, and and then they're caught. I mean, that's an extraordinary subject psychologically, isn't it? It is. I think. It is. If they're still alive. There's a plot there. Yeah. There's a plot there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're all working away. <laughs> <laughs> we'll work away. Um, It'll come out. Before, before we open it up to the um, audience, the other issue which uh, Jason and I have discussed um, in a radio interview is the, the expectation of justice that in the, um, in the classic English detective novel, yes. um, people did, the readers, they, they not only want justice to be restored, but they expect it to. They, trust the, they trusted the police. And when you get into other cultures where the police are not trusted, that becomes a big issue, I think. Jason? Well, yeah, certainly in Spain, because we were talking with Antonio Hill about yeah. that, and he said that comment about how in Mexico, was mm -hmm. it that he told some friends in Mexico that he was writing crime novels, and they said, well, why are you doing this? You know, the, the police are the bad guys. Yeah. You know. um, <laughs> so no, they actually said to me, why, why would you have a cop as a hero? Yes, yeah, they yeah, couldn't yeah, understand yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think the genre can work at all unless the police are honest. I, I, it, it couldn't work. You're quite right. How could it work? You've just got to, you've got to know the people investigating are telling the truth. Otherwise, there's no real problem. There's no real mystery. The whole thing is a nonsense, isn't it? Or you have your single honest man, like Zen, for example, yeah. you know, a That's single good Zen. man in this corrupt Although um, they're bad, uh, although they, they're quite, they can be quite corrupt, can't they now? I mean, Zen, Rebus, they do, they're, ba they're essentially bad guys who do the right thing in the end, often, these. Yeah, I suppose, I mean, I, when, I, um, when I wrote the first draft of, one of, my, of the first crime novel, um, and this came from a policeman who told me this, and I, and I included it into my character, he'd... He'd actually taken some money. He went, there was a drugs raid, there was a dead man on the floor, and there was like 50,000 euros just spread over the flo floor, and he just sort of took like a few hundred and put it in his back pocket. And in Spain, that's just kind of okay, you know, and I sort of, oh, this, I thought this was very realistic, I'll make, <laughs> I'll put this into, you know, uh, you know, I've got this from the horse's mouth. So I sort of put this into, gave this to my character, he'd done this in the past, and my publishers came back and said, I really don't think you should do this, you know, so, <laughs> you know, a British audience would not be quite so sympathetic to this sort of thing. Um, so, I, so, so I did change it, um, but I think, yeah, no, I mean, there's a sort of certain degree of law breaking, but it has to be, there has to be some sort of moral um, overview, surely. At the I mean, that, that he mm -hmm. is working to some greater moral mm -hmm. good, even if he can break the rules along the way. Oh, but it was Highsmith, of course, who said that art has nothing to do with morals and or moralising or convention, and I think that actually is an interesting um, point of view, um, and it brings into play inherent um, corruption and um, sort of instability that an awful lot of people seem to encounter, if not <coughs> suffer themselves. Well, when you get to Dexter, in which the, um, the detective is a serial killer, I mean, that's the extreme, yeah. um, the, the extreme yeah. end of the spectrum. But, but an extraordinarily well-functioning serial killer, mm. which is why actually the contrivance <laughs> there is, is, is sort of <laughs> absurd. <laughs> um, if we could bring the, uh, the lights up, I think we can do that, and then we can take... Um, yes, thank you. Excellent. We'll take um, questions from the audience for a while, and then we might move towards um, some... Yeah, we'll do our yeah. readings um, probably more towards the end. Uh, who, who would like... Yes, sir, would you... Uh, have we got microphones? We have. So we'll get a microphone down to that gentleman with the scarf, if you put your hand up, and then um, we'll see how we go from there. Thank you very much. Uh, I was interested in the... Um, description of the waxing and waning of religious faith and Protestantism, uh, particularly in connection with the mid-19th century. But I'd rather thought that at that time, with the creation of the Metropolitan Police CID, who started, I think, as plain clothes, wouldn't that also have engendered a great interest in detection, and that that would have given rise to what we see repeatedly now, the first detective story, 
which was all around the time of the 1850s to 1860s when detection became a career, really, uh, and an interest and something that really motivated an interest in people. I'll just repeat that. In fact, um, well, well, you worked on a, a, a historical crime story mm -hmm. as well. The significance of the mid-19th century and the rise of a professional yes. police force, um, the, the significance of that to the genre. Well, I think it was very significant. In fact, I, I forget who it was, but a very well-known detective writer who said he didn't think you could have a proper detective story until there was um, the detective force in the Metropolitan Police. And certainly when we look at crime novels, which are in the past, then we have to be trying to be accurate about what was happening at that time. And um, it, it, this was a huge, a huge change for the police. Before then, really, it was total muddle. The river police and those poor unfortunate watchmen, you know, who were usually over 80 and couldn't wait to get back into their cosy little corners, <laughs> actually, you know, actually investigating crime. And um, it's certainly, with my last book, Death Comes for Everybody, that's not so long before there was a, an official police force. And then it was left locally, the magistrates and the local constables. And they appointed the local constables, and the magistrates and the constables before them investigated. And the general view was, you always leave everything to local people. They know what's going on. Don't bring it up to London. Don't. And we've always had this strong feeling, haven't we, that we mustn't have a national police force. We never have. And maybe we shall end by having it. But the general feeling was, no, if you have that, they get too strong, and there'll be some bad eggs, and goodness knows what will happen. Keep it local, and people will keep an eye on them. So it has made a huge difference, I think, to crime writing and, of course, mainly to police investigation. Um, although every government suggests it, don't they, a British FBI? It's the first thing they yes, all say they, now. They, they more yeah. and more. I think, mm. I think this is because crime has become so international, and the big criminals are very, very wealthy men dealing in drugs or dealing in narcotics, and they go right across boundaries, obviously. And therefore, it does seem silly to have your police force, just one police force, um, dealing with your country, they've got to. And of course, there is our Interpol, but there's sometimes a feeling that, that we need more organization, we need more cooperation, we need more technology used to get these people. Also, you, know, you worked at the, the, the Home Office famously in your mm -hmm. time, but um, isn't, it is the case, isn't it, that some serial killers were not spotted in Britain for quite a long time because they, they kill people in different counties? And therefore, they didn't, <laughs> they didn't put together the um, killings. I can't say I know any particular thing, but I think it could well be. But of course, what we had in those days was calling in the yard. And nowadays, of course, the yard is not curled in so often because every police force has its forensic science service. Every police force has all the necessary technical resources it needs. And the yard, you know, are... I don't think they're ever called in. They were called into the Yorkshire River, but only to look and see what was happening and, and generally approve it. But otherwise, um, there is um, the, the local police really um, are responsible for everything that happens within their boundaries. And that may change, I suppose. And Jace, in, in a Spanish context, you have that in the, the relationship between the different police forces. Yes. That's one of the fascination of your books. Just for people who haven't yet read it, take us through that. There are, it's quite dizzying, isn't it? Uh, yeah, you've got, so you've got a national police force um, called the La, La Policia Nacional, um, and they deal with cities, towns and cities with a population of more than 50,000 people, I think. Anywhere else, the countryside and um, villages, what have you, they're um, looked after by the Guardia Civil, the civil guard, um, who were the main, that was what Franco used mainly as his sort of um, tool of repression. Um, and then you've got, a, you've got local police as well. So a, a town, like a big city, might have its own municipal police. Um, and then you've got, um, you've, got the, that's right, you've got the regional police as well. <laughs> it, it, it just goes on and on and on. And, and actually, I, you know, I talked to a policeman, I said, well, you know, who, there must be lots of rivalries and what have you. And, and, and there are, there are some really big rivalries, but surprisingly not so much between the national police and the civil guard, who are, as I say, they're also on a national level. The, the, it's the, 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 the guys who the, the national police really don't like are the municipal police because they get paid more than they do, but, and, they, and they have a sort of really sort of easy <laughs> job, apparently, you know. So, they all, so the national police get all the really hard work, and then they actually get paid less. So, so there's, you can use that quite a lot, you know, in the, it's good material for the books. Yes. 
Uh, and I, the thing I suppose <laughs> really, you know, terrorism must have made a huge difference. Really, hasn't it? I mean, the, the close cooperation between the police fighting terrorism and MI6 or MI5, whatever, the, the Secret Service. This well, is an entirely different kind of policing, isn't it, in a way? I think you've got this idea, it's similar in the sense that you've got this idea that you shouldn't have too much power with one yes. police force. So, like, so in Italy and France, um, you've got the same thing, you know, dividing it up. Mm. Um, but in Spain, obviously, there was the whole business in the 1980s when the police um, actually turned terrorists to against the terrorists mm. and th they created the, the GAL, this sort of illegal organization that went around kidnapping and killing suspected ETA members. So, so it, yes, things went really topsy-turvy. All power creates corruption. <laughs> so th the more powerful a police force is, or a security service for that matter, the more prone to being corrupt. I mean, Scotland Yard now, you know, wh wh what are they doing? They're in the pockets of New News International, you know, I mean. I, I don't have, I'm afraid, you know, I just, I'm, I'm very skeptical and, and rather cynical about, about the effectiveness actually of, of a lot of what the police are meant to be doing. And things, certainly things like, you know, white collar crime, financial crime, they've got, they're, they're way behind the curve on that. But the question of you uh, provoke a lot. Yeah, but the question of jurisdiction, though, which because you get that in uh, Northern Irish crime fiction now, which is beginning to come out. Yeah, uh, because the the range it's like Spain there. Uh, the novels that are being written now about the troubles in Northern Ireland. Yeah. You have the um, uh, the British Army. You have the RUC. Um, you have. Then there's the other one, which I don't get the initials right. There's the, there was the, um, oh, yeah, the yes, Ulster, yes, yes, yeah, yes, yes. yeah. And then you have the uh, Republic of Ireland police. But you also you have that in your novels, the trying to um, get a crime off onto someone else. There are famous stories from Ireland. If bodies were found in the river or the sea, you, you, there would be arguments over where the person actually who, died in order to, um, who, who took the case. Aren't they more likely to be crime novels than detective stories? Yeah. Oh, yes, there's a distinction. I, 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 ah. think, yeah. I, I think they are. Just talk to us about that distinction. <coughs> well, I think that to be a detective story, you have to have the mystery at the middle. You have to have a closed circle of suspects. You can't have numerous suspects, which, which of course, when you're talking about international terrorism, there's no limit to the suspects you might have. You have, you have a detective who comes in to solve the crime, and by the end of the book, you should be able to reach the right decision yourself by logical deduction inserted in the book with deceptive cunning but essential fairness. That put very, <laughs> very brutally is what a detective story is. There must be a mystery. There must be a logical, reasonable solution. You don't have to go into justice and whether you went to prison or didn't go to prison. There has to be a solution. But when you're talking of a crime novel, it's entirely different. It's absolutely different. And I mean, I suppose Brighton Rock is an example of a crime novel. We know mm. from the beginning that Harriet is going to be murdered. We know that Pinky is rotten. And the interest in the book is what is going to happen to these people, including Pinky's unfortunate girl wife. But there's no mystery there. We, we know. We know. And the excitement is quite otherwise than solving a mystery. Mm. So which genre do you two think you're writing in, Henry? Ah. Oh. I th <laughs> good question. Um, in fact, we, you know, we, I spend an awful lot of time talking to, to colleagues and students about the genre, even calling my course the writing of crime forward slash thriller fiction. And <laughs> I'm thinking of dropping the forward slash for, for next academic <laughs> year. I'm not qu even quite sure why. But, and then I'm thinking, well, th thrillers are always fictional anyways. You can't have th thriller fiction is nonsensical, but... but you couldn't, so I, I guess crime is, is, is I, I write crime novels is, is in, in the broader sense, but, but they, they incorporate bits of psychological crime and also to a certain degree in my most recent novel, um, a slight uh, aspects of procedural. Jason. I think I'm writing police procedurals. <laughs> 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 I'm still working it out. But there's an element of the whodunit there as well, so I'm sort of blending mm. genres. But, but we can also write the procedural thriller now, so I yeah. saw the other day. Mm. Um, yes, this side. Anyone like to start for this side with a question? Yes, yes, madam. Can we get a um, microphone down there? We were talking earlier about um, escapism and entertainment, but nowadays quite a lot of the crime novels are seen as social documents. I just wondered how you felt about that. 
Um, that was about the crime novel we talked about as entertainment, but they're, they're seen as often as social documents now. Um, a lot of, when I was making the series for Radio 4, a lot of the younger writers, they talk about using it to make a statement or a yes, point. Yes, indeed they are. And I think part of it is writing more realistic novels because I like to set mine unambiguously in the present age. And as I've got a girl detective, um, and she, uh, in one of the books, she had a very sick granny who'd brought her up. It was natural in that book that the police would expect her, or at least the social services expected her, to give up for a time and get leave to look after granny in a way they would never have expected anybody else to. So you don't set out to write a feminist novel, but you just have to be aware of these issues because they're now part of society. And if you're trying to write a realistic novel, and it's interesting with my friend Ruth Rendell that increasingly she is using the crime novel to say something about matters that are important to her, whether it's race or whatever it is. And I think that is happening. And the point is you need to do it very subtly because you're really not wanting to be a didactic writer. You're not going to want to, to reform people. You're telling a story and creating a mystery but there must always be this knowledge of the society in which it is set. And your society, you know, is a very different society from the one in a, a village in England. Although, Phyllis, you had one of, the, one of the great feminist titles still often used in, in headlines about various issues, an unsuitable job for a woman. I mean, you see that very often. And that's, um, it's quite a provocative title, that, isn't it? Well, it was. And, of course, that was set some time ago. And then, indeed, she was taking over... Um, the, she was working for a small detective agency, a very unsuccessful one, and the detective killed himself and left her the agency, and she took it over. And the general feeling there, of course, well, it's a very unsuitable job. She'll never make a go of it. But she did make a go of it. I loved that book. I thought it was rather good. Yeah, it was. <laughs> <laughs> do, you, um, do you think of yourself as a feminist writer? No, I think of myself as a writer. Um, I think I, I am a feminist in that I, uh, I love my sex in a sense and I feel that, that there is a lot that needs doing and making fair which is not fair. Huge advantages have happened in my long lifetime. I mean, I've lived for 92 years and believe me, when I was a child, you would never have thought that a woman could be prime minister or a chief constable or, or actually be in charge of an aircraft or one I met the other day who was captain of a ship of war. Um, you know, it was, it's just incredible what women have achieved and will continue to achieve, but there are still all sorts of rather, rather nasty, um, I think, um, differences. And I think that um, I particularly like, dislike the, the sort of atmosphere I think you can get in some offices, mm. which is just anti-female and anti-woman. Um, but um, I, I don't, think it, it don't, don't think it helps anybody to keep stressing that. We are making things better, I think, all the time, and women are achieving. And we must never forget that women who want to stay at home and bring up children are doing an incredibly important job. And they should have the choice of doing that if they want it. We ought to have the choice. <coughs> and I think largely we have the choice. And I've had, that just must be reflected in our novels. Do you fancy being Prime Minister? You'd be, um, <laughs> be very good. Not at the present. <laughs> <laughs> you got a book. I'm although not, I'm not thinking of doing away with Dave, although it might be, <laughs> qu it might be quite an advantage. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh... <laughs> although we, we've talked about this before, and because Death Comes to Pembley is um, a, a sequel to Jane Austen, uh, in the in the English novel, both the to make that distinction, both the traditional novel and the crime novel has always been dominated by women, hasn't it? I mean, that's one of the historically interesting, that Jane Austen, George Eliot, the yes. crime novel famously. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And women are very good at it. Women are very good writers. Yes. But also, they also make up, obviously, the, the, the largest uh, proportion of readers mm. as well, of certainly of crime fiction, of, of all fiction. I think but, all but, fiction. But, but, but crime fiction, I think that the, the gender divide is something like 75% to 25%. And I think women find the, crime, the detective story, not the crime novel, the detective story, particularly agreeable because it provides this structure. And within that structure, you can deal with really violent emotions and violent deeds and murder and all sorts of deeply unpleasant and disturbing things which a woman might 
really rather hesitate to put in a straight novel. I, I think it is a very, very supportive. Um, yes, we'll come over. I'll go from one side to the other. Yes, uh, gentleman at the front, if we could bring the microphone. Oh, we'll bring that one across. And then anyone on this side who'd like to, we could have the microphone ready for you. Uh, yes, there's a lady down here um, at the front. If we could get that microphone down to her, and we'll take this gentleman well, first. I'm, I'm a science teacher, and I was very interested in G.K. Chesterton's story where he confronts Father Brown and Sherlock Holmes. In the, I think it's the case of Mr. Glass. And the BBC did a wonderful broadcast where uh, the crime is really Sherlock Holmes condemning someone who's innocent because of his method. So my question is, in terms of that story, do you have the, the priest who's got holistic and non-reductionist who empathises with the victim to solve the crime, and then you have the rationalist, reductionist scientist who actually destroys um, the... Well, th through his solution, he, he creates his own crime in a way. I mean, do you, uh, I'm fascinated by how detective and crime novels look at the way we seek truth and portray that within their stories. That comes back to almost the, 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 the question over here is about, about realism too, doesn't it? And, and social, um, uh, the, the sort of social aspect of, of, of working out or, or interpreting and indeed exploring um, reality now and where we live and how we live and so on. I mean, it's, I think it's very hard to, I mean, to actually go out and think, right, this novel... Um, which is meant to be entertainment one way or another, and obviously the novel, its conventions, is, 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 is full of various contrivances and so on to actually make it completely truthful in that sense. But obviously I think the aim of the writer anyway is to try and achieve some form of truth or, or try and get to that um, question at least. Um, and I guess the more... I've always... The, the, the more boundaries, parameters you have on a particular form, a particular genre, the harder it is, in a way, to actually exercise aspects of truth um, if you are bound up very much with a plot that revolves around a set of, of precedents. You know, what sort of truth are you actually um, achieving there? I mean, in, in the more historical sense of crime fiction, which is why I think... The question over here um, asks the question, you know, is crime, crime writing now actually more realist? Is it more, um, you know, is truthful the right word? I'm not sure. But it's certainly, there are, you know, it's certainly become more realist. <coughs> the importance of truth yes, in no, crime Yes, I think it's crucial. I think it's mm. crucial to the, to the genre as, as itself. And how a particular detective goes about trying to uncover that truth. I mean, one, one of the reasons that I'm attracted to Simenon is because I think he's, it's the psychology, he understands the psychology of, of the perpetrator and, and or a situation. So that's, I think, how he's reaching his conclusions. It's not just the sort of, you know, the scientistic scient or reductionist approach. Um, and but that makes him attractive to me as a, as, a, as a human being, I think. So how your detective goes about solving the crime, so that's, it's sort of, it's like how's, you know, it maybe it reflects in some way you as a writer or, or not, if, if, if you're choosing not to have your detective as a sort of a, a, an alter ego, but it's sort of how you're approaching life itself and how you, you know, what, what's your take on, on just the mystery of existence, I think. Although one of the reasons the spy novel, I mean, uh, Henry mentioned spy novel, is so fascinating, I think, is that, I mean, Le Carre, one of the reasons he's an astonishing writer, I think, is that is the relativism, that there is, there is no truth to be And, and the shift found. in identities, yeah. too. But, but in a way, Le Carre's main aim was, was, was actually, you know, his, his, or rather his, his aim of fire, if you like, were, were, were corrupt institutions. And that was his thing. And, and the, what he was championing, in a way, was... was was, was the individual, was, was a sense of individual freedom rather than actually a institutional freedom. And I think in a way that's the truth he was looking for. But there's a, you've always got the movement towards truth, haven't you? Even if you don't find it at the end or, it or it's relative or it's, it's uncertain. Mm. The move towards truth is crucial to, yeah. the, to the genre to begin with. But it? that famous, I won't say which one in case people haven't read it, but the famous exchange at the end of one of the Le Carre's, uh, George Smiley, um, you won George, and he says famously, um, I suppose I did. 
did I? And he, he doesn't think he did. But I mean, that's an, I think that's an amazing moment. Um, yes, the lady in blue. I heard Ian Rankin recently express the view that men can't write good women detectives. I just wondered if the panel... <laughs> I've been struggling since then to think of an example uh, to disprove that, but I haven't succeeded. I wonder if the panel... I've got any ideas? Um, Martin, Martin I'll, just, I'll, just, I'll just repeat that, um, Henry, for Phyllis. Um, uh, yes, uh, Ian Rankin said recently that men cannot create convincing women detectives. He gave that as a reason for why he didn't um, uh, take, make Siobhan the central character after Rebus left. Um, do, do you think that's true, that men can't create successful women detectives? Well, unfortunately, we haven't done enough examples, have we? They haven't <laughs> really created them in any large numbers. Certainly, I can't at the moment just think of one, whether successful or not successful, that a man has created. And they usually, when they are created, in a sort of subordinate role. You don't usually find a man responsible to a woman. And of course, in many police forces, that is how it is, because the woman is chief constable. But that has not sort of got into fiction yet. <laughs> and I, I wonder whether it will. I think it, I think it would be difficult. I think it's much easier for women to create men than it is for men to create women. I think to an awful lot of men, we are still one huge secret society that they can never, <laughs> quite, <understand. laughs> they can never quite understand. Although, um, although one of my great campaigns is I think Linda LaPlante has not been given enough <coughs> credit. Because it, it, oh, part of it is on television. But absolutely. D Jane Tennyson is Marvelous. one of the crucial characters absolutely in Marvelous. crime fiction. But I then think. you see a woman. It's woman well, right that's what I mean. No, I'm giving her that credit. But, um, but she introduced... Uh, there, there was nothing before that of anything... I know, I'm, I'm trying to not think. I mean, a, a, a novel I've read... In fact, um, Lee Child's most recent novel, The Wanted Man, has two um, female, strong female characters who are, are key um, CIA, uh, and one's CIA, one's FBI. Um, so uh, they're not the Lee characters, but they are, the, they are key characters. And, and he, surprisingly, perhaps, always creates very strong female characters who who might be you know a police a local police chief or someone quite high up in 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 the FBI for instance or the army for that matter also it also ties into the latest question about reflecting society because Linda Lafon says when she wanted to research it and she um, rang up and asked to speak to a w woman DCI th they said well there are only hard two of them so you have to speak to one <laughs> or the other so it's um <laughs> I, th I mean, I think any any novelist, you know, if you can't create um, characters that are not of your gender, then I, then you perhaps shouldn't be in the game. I mean, I think you you have to be able to create male and female characters as easily as one or the other. Although it's a very common view that um, male writers are not as good at women as women are at men. This view is put forward by women critics and novelists very <laughs> largely. But but do you uh, do you agree with it? No. No. Jason. Um, no, sorry, Phyllis. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. No, no, no. I was just going to say, when it comes to Tennyson, she's not exactly happy, is she? That's the no, point. That's she's right. tremendously successful. But as a woman, she's not a happy woman in any of her relationships. And I think, I, I think that happens really mm. with almost all fiction when you get a really strong woman. You don't usually come that she's got a very happy marriage, three or four gorgeous kids. No, it doesn't seem to work like that. No. That's what I was saying. I think there are almost no happy detectives in fiction. Maygrave no, is perhaps Not happy, many. isn't he? Maygrave is happy. He's kind of, he's, yeah, he's, he's content. Yeah. And, and he's, 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 um, he's faithful to his wife, yeah. un unlike um, his creator, as yes. fam famously. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, uh, we'll come back to this side. Anyone here who would like to... We're going to he kisses me a long time. close with readings <laughs> a moment. La last chance to raise a hand on that side. Don't go home regretting. No, okay. Anyone on that side who would like to ask a... F yes, I can see... Is there, I can see a hand there at the back. Yes. Can we get a microphone? I can see a sort of burgundy <laughs> hand. Yeah. Um, at the beginning of a detective story, do you always know who the perpetrator is going to be? At the beginning of a story, do you always know who the perpetrator is? I do, because that's how I work, really. Um, I, I plot in great detail, very great detail, and I have the structure uh, in all sets and, and down in black and white 
in notebooks and so on before I begin. But what is interesting is the book always changes when you actually write it. So you never get the book you thought you were going to get, not completely. But certainly, I know, you know who did it, why he or she did it, who the suspects are, what their motives were, how the truth will be discovered. All that is clear in my mind before I start writing. And just between, between friends, is, is there a book on the way at the moment? Well, there's a plot in my mind, <laughs> and I'm rather excited by it. But quite frankly, a 93 in August, and I am not all t entirely fit, and I would hate to leave something un unfinished. That's really rather a horror. Mm. It used to be when I, when I did overseas tours and was flying a lot. I always took the book I was working on, of course, but I thought, that's the worst thing if this plane goes in, down in the ocean. <laughs> 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 a book unfinished which somebody will tamper with. So who knows? If I had the energy, I'd love to, I'd love to do one more. Just one more. We hope so. Um, is, do, you, do you know? Uh, no, not normally. Or well, Sometimes when I start a novel, I think I know, and then I change a quarter of the way through, a third of the way through. I, I sort of think if you know as a writer, then somehow the reader will know right at the beginning. Because, you know, every sort of sentence is somehow leading towards that um, reveal. Um, so, no, I, I don't like the plot that closely. I don't know whether it was Ruth, but I think somebody, it may have been Ruth Rendell, who completely changes in the last chapter and think, that'll fool them. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I plot very carefully, yes, before I um, start writing, because I think then I can... Um, Constant when I'm writing, I can concentrate on writing, and I'm not having to think about plotting. Yeah. So that would, you know, my brain isn't quite big enough to do the two things at once. So um, that's yeah. So I try to sort of limit what I need to actually do when I'm actually when I'm at the uh, uh, when I'm actually doing the writing. But like with you, I find that things can change. They do change. Um, it's suddenly that you know your character leads you in a different direction. Exactly. But essentially, the yes. core is there and from the yes. beginning. And do you have those moments when suddenly something is solved? It's a tricky thing. You just feel, oh, it never happened like this. This is the feeling I've got. Something this is wrong. It all hangs together, but there's something wrong about it. And then in the morning, you suddenly think, Absolutely. that's where yes. he went. That's what yes. she did. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's a wonderful feeling. Well, yes, usually when you're just waking Absolutely. up, you're coming out of a dream. It, it, yes. it comes. Very it's much a so. marvellous feeling. OK, we're going to... We haven't got that much time, so um, uh, we have a, a short little reading from um, each of our writers. Um, so are you ready? Yeah. You want me to go first? Could you go first, please, if you can? But um, um, with the, the eye on brevity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to get comfortable now. <laughs> right, th this is... Um, the very beginning of my new novel, which will be out in, in April, and it's about a crime writer um, struggling with his new novel. Um, <laughs> uh, this is... Uh, here we go. As ever, I'm probably staring out of the window at flowers, at foliage anyway, a few straggly roses, clematis, possibly ferns, perhaps, a vine maybe, and plenty of other stuff, weeds notably where I'm looking at the sky through the long, slim, slightly grimy panes above the French windows, watching clouds build and threaten while urging my mind to race off elsewhere. Or I'm just looking at my screen, my chapped, chubby hands hovering lamely over the keyboard. Perhaps I'm glancing at the books and paperwork stacked up on my desk, the mounds of receipts and bills, invoices and remittance slips, contracts and invitations, the old bit of fan mail too, having arrived the old-fashioned way via my publishers and through the letterbox. I like to hang on to these cards, these letters. Some, I guess, have been sitting there for a while. So in many ways, while trying to avoid these things that will never get properly dealt with or filed, and trying to concentrate, trying to think about what I do best, while panicking a little because a deadline is looming, more bills have to be paid, and my brand enhanced, an image appears as if from nowhere. Thank God. Not, of course, that I believe in one. In my game, this, then, is how I'm going to begin it. First light, Christmas morning. A thin, freezing fog was drifting in from the sea across the tide line, the frosted dunes, and curling around the decrepit hotels and guest houses, the long since shut and boarded arcades and amusements. A fun fair from another era lost further up the Golden Mile. He crossed the road, his dog trotting obediently by his side. Out of habit, he looked behind him, and front again, scanned every which way, 
not that he could see far, but far enough that hell he was the only fool about at this time and in this place why he liked it. His grey Hugo Boss puffer was zipped tight, his orange beanie pulled low, yet still the air was getting straight to his bones. Once on the sand, Baz, his black and tan boxer, immediately bounded out of view, increasing his pace, not because he was worried about the dog, but, trying to, but, to, but to try to generate some warmth. He headed straight towards the sea on a faint path. They always went the same way across this area of outstanding natural beauty. How it had been designated as such was a mystery. Baz, he shouted at last, where the hell are you? Thank you very much. <coughs> and um, Jason. Um, okay, so this was the shortest extract I could find. Um, <laughs> my detective, um, and he's with his colleague, and they're eating lunch. They spend a lot of time eating lunch, actually. Um, I think there's a sen basic sensuality to m Mediterranean crime writing, which I try to... Um, get across. So, there, so um, my detective Max Camera is with his um, colleague Torres and they're having paella. They're eating paella together instead of chasing the bad guys. Um, There's a kind of rating system for rice dishes, Torres said. All part of the mystery of paella. You're not going to get mystical on me, are you? Paella is not just food for a Valencian. It's a way of life. Torres su took a swig of his fizzy red drink and pursed his lips. You know all this already, or at least you should do. You've been here long enough. All right, camera held up his hands. No disrespect. So what's this rating system then? Bo, rebo, and mel. Torres flicked out his fingers as he listed the words. It's like giving marks to a paella, depending on how good it is. Camera chuckled. Serious stuff, Torres stared at him. A family can spend the whole mealtime arguing over which, which grade to give the paella. All right, so what do they mean? Torres gave him a look. Bo, as you should know by now, is Valencian for good. Rebo means very good. And mel, mel means honey. That's the top mark? Torres frowned. Kind of. Well, is it or isn't it? There's another one above that, but it's hardly ever used. Perhaps never. It belongs to the perfect archetypal paella, like some kind of platonic <laughs> ideal. One that's been made over an open fire using only wood from an orange tree. <laughs> and using Valencian water. Of course, it's impossible to make paella from water from anything else. It doesn't, doesn't come out the same. And this top mark is de categoría, Torres said, his Valencian accent thickening slightly, all open vowels like a yowling cat. You think Plato had paella in mind when he was coming up with his theory of forms? There's a form for everything, Torres hit back, even the hairs in your nose. Or at least that's what my mate Joaquin told me at school. I never did understand much in philosophy classes. Camera lifted up, lifted up a spoon of rice and meat. So what category is this one, then? I reckon it's pretty mal. Get out of here. You don't know what you're talking about. This? He pointed at his plate and frowned in concentration. Bo. You can't give it more than that. <laughs> Camera put the spoonful in his mouth. It tasted all right to him, perhaps a little heavy on the oil, now that he thought about it. So what's below bo, then? What happens if it's a bad paella? Torres scowled. No such thing, he said. <laughs> <laughs> That book, my dear. Uh, death in Valencia. Uh, death in Valencia. Death in Valencia. Yes. And I, I'm sure I, I'm sure Jason will give you one afterwards if you'd like um, a copy. No, I don't believe in that. I'll buy one. <laughs> <laughs> and <coughs> P.D. James. Yes. Well, I'm going to read a short bit. So putting it in thing. This is in Pemberley. Uh, Elizabeth has been married to Darcy for six years. There are two babies upstairs in the nursery. She's had a wonderful evening with her. Uh, uh, sister there, the Bingleys are there. They've been having music. Georgiana's been playing. Everything has been civilized and peaceful. And then Darcy looks out of the window just when they're going to bed, and there is this chaise coming at huge speed towards the house out of a part of the estate which is called the Wild Wood because it really is very wild. And here they are. It's coming at immense pace. The coach was still coming at speed, rocking round the corner at the end of the woodland road to approach the house. Elizabeth thought that it would surely rattle past the door, but now she could hear the shouts of the coachman and see him struggling with the reins. The horses were pulled to a halt and stood there, rootless and neighing. Immediately, and before he could dismount, the coach door was opened, and in the shaft of light from Pemberley, they saw a woman almost falling out and shrieking into the wind. With her hat hanging by its ribbons round her neck 
and her loose hair blowing about her face, she seemed like some wild creature of the night, or a mad woman escaped from captivity. For a moment, Elizabeth stood rooted, incapable of action or thought. And then she recognised that this wild, shrieking apparition was Lydia, and ran forward to help. But Lydia pushed her aside, and still screaming, thrust herself into Jane's arms, nearly toppling her. Bingley stepped forward to assist his wife, and together they half carried Lydia to the door. She was still howling and struggling, as if unaware who was supporting her. But once inside, protected from the wind, they could hear her harsh, broken words. Wickham's dead. Denny has shot him. Why don't you find him? They're up there in the woodland. Why don't you do something? Oh, God, I know he's dead. And then the sobs became moans, and she slumped into Jane's and Bingley's arms, as together they urged her gently towards the nearest chair. Thank you very much. Um, they'll now be, uh, the authors will sign their books. Um, thank you uh, to our audience. Thank you to Henry Sutton and to Jason Webster. Um, I'm sure they uh, won't object if I say that it's um, a particular uh, privilege to be with um, P.D. James, who I am now going to call Baroness James of Holland Park. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.